is too big to fail. So far, the Securities and Exchange Commission has filed suit against only one Goldman Sachs employee, a young mid-level trader named Fabrice Touré, who was part of an effort at the bank to essentially place bets that the housing market would collapse. The prosecution of Touré was the subject of a front-page article in The New York Times this week, written by one of our next guests, Gretchen Morganson. Gretchen Morganson is the Pulitzer Prize-winning business reporter at The New York Times, who's written extensively on how the U.S. government has failed to prosecute any of the top figures who played a role in the economic crash. She's co-author of a new book called Reckless Endangerment, How Outsized Ambition, Greed and Corruption Led to Economic Armageddon. Her co-author, Joshua Rosner, is an expert on housing finance and a part at the independent research consultancy firm of Graham Fisher and Company. The book, in the book, they argue that the root of the financial crisis lies in President Clinton's decision to heavily promote home ownership in the 90s and the lowering of lending standards by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, Gretchen Morganson and Joshua Rosner, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Um, let us start with uh, with Gretchen Morganson. Just lay out the thesis of this book. Well, the thesis really is that Fannie Mae, which of course was created in 1938 to um, you know help homeowners have access to credit to borrow to get a home, really sort of expanded um, in a way that was designed very much to benefit the insiders at the company. Remember, this is a company that was both public and private, had a lot of government perquisites and received those perquisites and used them to its own advantage. So it's, it's a story, I think, of, of how sort of good and noble ideas can go awry and really a lesson in how not to allow that to happen again. And, Joshua, how exactly did uh, Fannie Mae go from being a government-created agency to basically a private corporation backed by the government? Yeah. So the government uh, in, uh, in the late 1960s uh, decided that they needed a competitor for, uh, for Fannie Mae, so they created Freddie Mac. Uh, they ended up privatizing both of those decade later. And uh, in privatizing, they retained a line of credit to the Treasury, which wasn't really large enough to matter. Uh, fundamentally, but it told the markets, it implied to the markets, along with other benefits that they had, such as not having to file financial statements with the SEC, as all other companies did, that these were special companies. These were companies that retained uh, some government support. And so publicly they would say, and they would put on all of their debt issuances, that these are not obligations guaranteed by the government. But privately and quietly there would always be a wink-wink, nudge-nudge that went along with that comment, uh, to the point where foreign central banks became more and more and more comfortable buying uh, government-sponsored enterprise debt, Fannie and Freddie debt, as a proxy for U.S. Treasury debt, because they'd get the extra, the extra yield, and uh, they believed that it was government-guaranteed. Well, if there's a, if, if I can say, if there's a key villain in uh, in your story, uh, it's James Johnson, who was for a long period of time the chief executive of, of uh, Fannie Mae. You quote at one point that under Johnson, uh, Fannie Mae uh, uh, led the way uh, in encouraging loose lending practices among the banks whose loans the company brought. A Pied Piper of the financial sector, Johnson led both the private and public sectors down a path that led directly to the credit crisis of. 2008. Uh, but now, now, some people, though, have questioned whether you're not uh, sort of um, echoing uh, the criticism that's been raised by some of the Republican uh, Tea Partiers, Sarah Palin herself, saying Freddie and Fannie <laughs> were behind the whole crisis. Uh, this whole issue of uh, the the reduction of lending standards uh, by the government and by Fannie Mae and how that affected the crisis. Can you talk about that? We're certainly not saying that Fannie and Freddie were the, you know, key uh, movers in this. They were, Fannie was a lead mover, a prime mover, first mover. And Jim Johnson really was um, a person who really taught the entire financial services industry how to co-opt their regulator, how to co-opt Congress, so that they could achieve what they wanted. And in many ways, this was personal enrichment, made a lot of money, the top executives of Fannie Mae. This, you know, is not our idea of what a government-sponsored enterprise should do. But so they were a primary mover, not the key, not the only movers. We had Wall Street very involved after Fannie Mae led the way. So it, it really isn't that simple.
including uh, including the fact that you have to remember there was a symbiotic relationship between Fannie and Freddie and the private firms. Fannie, uh, Fannie Mae's largest customer was Countrywide. Countrywide sold uh, m more of their volume to Fannie Mae than any other any other lender, and that relationship. Uh, is really part of the ebb and flow of the private versus the government sponsored. So even as early as, as 2001, I had written a paper called Housing in the New Millennium, A Home Without Equity is Just a Rental with Debt, in which I, I, I warned that we would end up where we ended up. Fannie and Freddie were really the only players. There wasn't very much of a private market. The private market was where banks would make loans and hold them on their balance sheet. But the private label securitization market, the, the mortgage-backed securities market, really was innovated after that. And so Fannie and Freddie were part of the drivers of the creation of that private label market and supported it, buying a lot of the private label mortgages mortgage-backed securities that these other firms, Countrywide and Deutsche Bank and others, would end up issuing Goldman Sachs. Uh, one of the revelations in your book has made headlines in Massachusetts. In 1991, Fannie Mae hired Frank's um, partner, Herb Moses, out of graduate school. Barney Frank. Uh, Barney Frank, congressman. Uh, call, uh, Frank called up uh, VP at Fannie to praise Moses' qualifications at the time. Uh, congressman Frank was a member and later became chair of the House Financial Services Committee. Great. Great job. You know, um, we spoke with Barney about this as we were preparing the book and um, really wanted to ask him, you know, 91 was a crucial moment in time because after the SNL crisis, Congress was concerned that there would be losses at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that the taxpayer might have to bear. And so they were putting in place some new regulation to keep those losses from happening. And so this was a crucial moment for the company. and. Yet Barney Frank spoke with people at Fannie Mae about hiring his partner. His partner was then hired. There was a red carpet rolled out for him by the company because, of course, they were eager to provide this kind of a favor for a person who was in a position of power. We asked Frank if he felt that this conflicted him at all. He said absolutely not. But if you look at the record, you see tremendous um, uh, pushback from Frank in congressional hearings against the very idea of being careful about safety and soundness at Fannie Mae. Uh, Joshua? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, and I think that that example, which has made headlines because it's, you know, a little bit salacious, um, is really one example, and it's not just Barney Frank, it's both sides of the aisle it's Republicans and Dems, of the way the financial service industry really captured Congress with favors, with relationships, um, hiring uh, senators' uh, sons to run their partnership offices. Uh, Barney Frank, you know, there's, a, there's one that I don't think had ever been reported at all that we, we include, which I think is even more is sort of interesting, which is that uh, the Fannie Mae Foundation which provided annual awards and grants to, you know, folks who helped housing the most, awarded a charity that was founded by Barney Frank's mother uh, annual awards on at least uh, two, two occasions. occasions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that type of relationship uh, really does bind elected officials to corporate interests uh, in a way that I f uh, we feel is, is important to discuss, not necessarily in the public interest. I want to get back to this issue of the lowering of lending standards, because mm -hmm. one of the—I said the first half of the book is really sort of dedicated to this, how this process unraveled. And, and you say uh, at one point that when the Boston Fed, uh, uh, I think it was in the 90s, uh, early 90s, comes up with a report showing that there had, in fact, been discrimination uh, uh, in the lending industry toward minority groups. Uh, that there was a that the one of the few publications that raised issues about this report was a Forbes magazine, and you, I think you quote a, uh, 
uh, uh, some of the staff members, Peter Brimlow, who I, I remember in particular, challenging this whole this whole notion that uh, there had been uh, racial discrimination in lending practices. Now, I happen to know a little bit about Brimlow because later on, a few years later, he wrote a book called Alien Nation uh, that became a, widely criticized because it, the theory was that the United States was being brought down by massive third world immigration. So I don't expect that Peter Brimlow would be the kind of person who would like stand up against racial discrimination. But I, the question of the impact, how central was the lowering of standards uh, uh, by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, in lending standards, how much was that a part of it and how much was actual fraud by the industry, by the brokers, by the appraisers, by, uh, by all, uh, the Mozillos of the world who actually uh, engineered fraudulent loans? Right. So, on the most simple level, if you were to think about it today, we have, uh, you know, about 40 percent of American homeowners have or, or are close to having negative equity, okay? If we had retained the lending standards that existed prior to 1995, where you really had to have 20 percent down payment, it would be a fraction of that that would have negative equity. We would not be sitting here having this conversation about a national housing crisis. Um, that is a major part of this, was we went from 20 percent down, other than through explicit and direct government subsidy programs, right, the, the VA programs, right, the certain Gini programs, the farm uh, credit programs. We went from that to Fannie and Freddie driving from a 20 percent down, down to a 5 percent down, down to a 3 percent down, to starting to play with as early as 2001, zero percent down pro, uh, programs, which, by the way, if you put zero down, closing costs are about five percent. So really, you've got negative equity day one. That is a setup for a disaster if home prices start falling. And so if you start talking to congressmen and senators about, you know, at some point, if home prices fall, the people who you loved the ribbon-cutting ceremonies that you got for putting them in homes are going to start accusing you of, of trapping them in homes that they couldn't afford becomes a reality. But what percentage of it was uh, new buyers, poor folks buying uh, their first home, and what percentage was well-to-do people trying to refinance, constantly refinance, and or interest-only loans Absolutely. to be able to get equity out of their house on the on the theory that the house was going to continue to increase that's in value. Great, and that's a, that's a really important and great point. So, home ownership rates, which had been stagnant in the early 1990s at between uh, at about 63 percent, started rising to 64, 64 and a half percent. Out comes this initiative to increase home ownership to record levels by the end of the decade. We get to 69.5 percent by the end of 2000, and we end up peaking in home ownership late 2003, early 2004. So that's really home ownership rates did peak long before the real estate market peak. So 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007 were a combination, as I think you're pointing out, of refinancing activity, which was stripping equity. And it wasn't just the well-to-do. It was anyone who had equity was, was given incentives to take mortgages that allowed them to strip the equity out of their home, to remodel their bathroom, to buy that other, you know, the riding lawnmower, whatever it was. And it was second home and investment property purchases on speculation. Don't forget that incomes were stagnant right. throughout this period. Mm -hmm. And so for many people, it wasn't taking equity out to go to Europe, to spend on some frivolous item. It was to maintain Absolutely. a lifestyle or keep, you know, their income at a level that they could actually live. So there was a lot of equity extraction that was not based upon, you know, buying or consumerism or something that was frivolous. You know, I think that one of the most poisonous paradoxes that we found in our reporting for the book was that the very people that the government was claiming to want to help, first-time home buyers, minorities, um, immigrants, were the people who were hurt the most by this crisis. If you look at foreclosure rates among minorities, far higher. Mm -hmm. If you look at delinquency rates and problem mortgages and bankruptcy filings, it's really so much worse mm -hmm. among these very people.